Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to everyone who's here in person with us at the University of Chicago and to everyone who's joining us from all over the world uh, remotely. We're thrilled to have you. Um, I'm Ethan Winter de Mesquita. I'm the interim dean of the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth annual Reverend Dr. Richard L. Pearson Lecture. Each year, this event provides an opportunity for us to hear from leading practitioners about their experience working to resolve some of the world's most consequential and enduring conflicts. The lecture is sponsored by the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts. The Pearson Institute was founded in 2015 and is led by Harris Professor James A. Robinson. The mission of the Institute is to promote the discussion, understanding, and resolution of global conflicts through research, education, and engagement. I'm going to be intellectual just for a second because we're here at the University of Chicago. So there's this maxim <clears throat> from the great 19th century philosopher Auguste Comte that I think really gets to the heart of what makes the Pearson Institute, especially under Jim's visionary leadership, so special and important. Uh, in translation, Comte said roughly, we have only destroyed that which we have replaced. That is, if you don't want something to come back after you've gotten rid of it, you better put something new in its place. The scholars at the Pearson Institute dedicate themselves to understanding the causes of conflict, but they don't stop there. They forge on to the even deeper questions of understanding how one builds peace and stability, because they know that if one wants to destroy conflict, it is not enough to stop the shooting. One must replace the institutions, the norms, and the preconditions that cause that violence with new institutions, norms, and conditions that lay the foundations of peace. Through courses, research, and a series of events offered through the Pearson Institute, we've had the chance to learn from those working to understand conflicts and to build peace around the world, including in Afghanistan, Colombia, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Our understanding, our scholarship, and our teaching are immeasurably enriched by these opportunities. Today, we will hear from our distinguished speaker from Sudan, Ibrahim al Badawi, who has served as the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning in the Republic of Sudan between September 2019 and July of 2020. I'm looking forward to hearing from Mr. al Badawi. Though first, I'd like to introduce Hisham Youssef to offer a few re introductory remarks. Hisham is a Pearson Fellow, a second-year MPP student at the Harris School, a former student of mine, and an active-duty armor officer in the United States Army. He is currently on leave to attend graduate school and following the completion of his studies, he will continue his military service as a social sciences instructor at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Passionate about the roots and links between political thought and action, Hisham will teach political theory and American politics before returning to the combat force. While at Harris, he served as an intern with DT Institute's Stabilization, Transition, and Peacebuilding Division. Yusuf holds a bachelor's degree in international studies in Arabic from the Virginia Military Institute, writing his thesis on the viability of South Sudan on the eve of the secession. Born in Dubai to Sudanese parents, he's fluent in Arabic and calls Virginia home. Welcome, Hisham. Okay. Interim Dean, Dr. Robinson, friends of Pearson, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, quite a pleasure for me to get this chance to say a few words before the start of this year's Pearson Lecture and to help in some modest way frame for you what comes next. To study global conflict as we are apt to do here at Pearson. Um, is to uh, study tragedy. It is not for the faint of heart. The situation in Sudan is no different. Lucky for us, we have Dr. Ibrahim al badawi today to see us through. He is, as was said, the managing director of the Economic Research Forum and a former finance minister of Sudan. <clears throat> 
He held the post during that most fragile of periods uh, we know in sanitized academic circles as democratic transition. But let me just give you an idea of what he had to go through. Dr. al Badawi was in charge of a ministry responsible for an economy controlled in large part by an army who a few short months before the start of his tenure showed the appetite to massacre protesters who threatened by the very act of protesting the lucrative advantages a dictatorship has afforded over 30 years. He was in charge of that economy. How about that for a portfolio? Sadly, it was his fate to see the transition interrupted by violence. But despite that, you're going to see him carry himself with gentle humil humility, a hospitable, contagious optimism that in the end and ultimately the democratic forces in Sudan will win. The Sudanese are famous among the Arabs for their ability to make peace. They absorb tragedy with an heroic acceptance of fate, but an acceptance that allows them the calm to redouble their efforts to seek settlement and rush to let bygones be bygones. It was a lesson I was happy to be reminded of talking to Dr. El Bedoui. You see, he reminds me of the Sudan I was raised to understand and to cherish. My Sudanese parents saw fit that their son grow up not just in a stable home, but in a Sudanese home. I could sing the national anthem of Sudan at six and name every president from the, uh, from the evacuation of the British all the way up to Omar al-Bashir. <laughs> sure, my dad would tell me we had coups in Sudan but there were always bloodless coups, he would say, which is ironic to look back at it. He would say, long before the Arab Spring, Sudan protested their way to democracy twice, in 65 and in 85. I was taught that humility, piety, hospitality were the hallmarks of this land and that education was the crown virtue that was going to build a peaceful and democratic Sudan. That was how, that's what I was taught growing up in Dubai. How do we go from that to talking to loved ones over the phone in Khartoum with the crack of gunfire in the background just last month? That is a process, a tragic process of awakening for me and for the Sudan. I researched it as an undergrad and I got every understanding of democratic transition except for one, experience with dictatorship. I had a quixotic idea of going back after I graduated to work in Sudan. I visited repeatedly over the preceding decade and each visit was a dipstick measure of just how corrupting dictatorship can be to a people. Suffering too many setbacks, uh, I, my path with Sudan diverged and I made Virginia home. However, not all is lost. Spending some time with Dr. El Bedoui, I came away with a second recognition that even as I drift away from Sudan, being here at Pearson, studying conflict resolution is in a way still tied to that adolescent commitment to the nobility of studying conflict, studying it clear-eyed and ready to architect its prevention where possible. We read tragedies not to dwell in lamentation, but as an invite to sublimation, a rediscovery that in the midst of dark stories, heroic natures can persist, and there is catharsis in that. And so, to see the finance minister, who had bayonets outside of his window, carry himself with such humility and optimism, despite setback, despite the headlines, despite it, it is, in essence, the quintessence of the Sudanese people. A reminder to accept fate, but not to despair, and instead, redouble your effort to find peace no matter what. Because peace is fated, even if war is as well. <laughs>
So, with that said, Dr. Butterwee, we are extremely lucky to have you. And before then, I'd like to welcome to the podium the director of the Pearson Institute and the Reverend Dr. Richard L. Pearson, Professor of Global Conflict Studies, Dr. James Robinson. Professor. I'm a, I'm a bit I'm a bit underdressed I'm afraid uh, thank you brilliant um, I'm going to be very brief uh, I'm James Robinson uh, we're really excited uh, to have Ibrahim El Badawi today I'm just going to say one thing about Ibrahim he and I we've known each other probably about 20 years or so we've met in many different parts of the world and I just want to say you know what I admire about him so much you know in in, in a place like the US or Britain where I grew up you know, we have this amazing luxury. We can just be academics. You know, we can go to the library, we can write papers, we can teach lectures, we can read books, we can study, we can... But I think, you know, growing up in Sudan, you could be an academic, but you have to be something else too. You have to care about changing the society and being involved in the society. And Ibrahim is not just an academic and someone who's been a scholar, who's been a teacher, who's been a policymaker trying to change his society in the transitional government, but he also is someone who creates incredible opportunities for somebody. So he's always got one foot in different institutions trying to create opportunities, trying to build resources, trying to bring people into academia, into policy. So he has this kind of remarkable personality, this remarkable ability to do many things simultaneously, which I'm, I'm completely in awe of because I feel I can hardly do one thing properly, uh, rather not many. And so, so I think that's, that's why we're so excited uh, to have him here today talking about Sudan, and you know, which for me is a kind of microcosm the history of Sudan, which Hisham was just talking about, it's a kind of microcosm of everything I've been trying to understand for the last uh, 40 years in my research. So um, without further ado, as they say, let's bring the man on stage. Good afternoon, everybody. I am honored to be invited to the University of Chicago. Chicago is a special place for my wife and I. It is where I spent the last two years of my PhD uh, and where our eldest daughter was born. I would like to thank Anna Mideris and the Pearson, Institu uh, Pearson Institute team for organizing this event. I would also like to thank Dean uh, Ethan de Mesquita and Hisham Youssef, as well as uh, my good friend uh, James Robinson for the kind introductions. I am also grateful to Professor Robinson for the invitation to deliver the Pearson 2023 annual lecture at the Harris School. We had the privilege of hosting Professor Robinson during January of this year in the capital of Sudan, Khartoum, to speak to Sudanese youth, politicians, civil society actors, and academics about the Nori Corridor model and his uh, well-known book with his uh, colleague, the, the Rona Simoglu, uh, to speak about this and its relevance to the case of Sudan. And today is perhaps a continuation of that conversation we had in January, but in the backdrop of what is now effectively a total state breakdown a high-intensity factional military warfare threatening to 
deteriorate into a full-blown civil war. I am now wondering if we should have had some of the leadership of the armed forces from both sides attend that talk by Professor Robinson in January, as we might have avoided the event of April, though that is probably my own wishful thinking. Today, my talk will delve into the political process and transition that started in December 2018, the economic policy making during that time, our high hopes and the tragic collapse that came after, but also the important step that might offer some optimism and hope for the future. Let me very briefly present a few slides by way of introduction to Sudan. Sudan, I am here to talk to you about, is a country and people that inherited uh, an ancient Nubian Kushite civilization that built its own pyramids and managed to extend its reach into the Arabian Peninsula and their queens, uh, whom they call Kandaka in the Nubian language, and kings, Ajaji, were mentioned in the Old Testament. This civilization eventually gave in to Christendom and then subsequently morphed into an Arabized uh, Muslims or Arabized Muslim kingdoms. Eventually, these territories and people came under Ottoman Turks and later British rule in the 1800s. Owing to the great Mahdi's revolution, though short-lived, Sudan became the second country to gain independence from the British Empire in January 26, 1885, after, of course, the United States. There is a second uh, curious connection Sudan has with the Americans also. In the Second Franco-Mexican War, more than 440 Sudanese soldiers were part of an international force sent to Mexico by Napoleon III. They proved to be fierce fighters and were honored and decorated upon their return to Egypt in 1867. These events, of course, occurred under colonial rule, and these soldiers were part of a conscripted army. Sudan, though no longer the largest country in Africa, after the partitioning of the country in 2011 and the creation of the Young Republic of South Sudan, is now the third, still now the third largest country in Africa, it is at the crossroad of Sub-Saharan Africa and the Middle East, bordering the Red Sea. It shares its borders with seven countries. The White and Blue Nile meet in Khartoum, the capital, merging to become the River Nile, which flows all the way to the Mediterranean via Egypt. It's an Afro-Arab country of about 45 million people endows, endowed with immense agricultural potential. At the heart of it is a two million acres of irrigated agriculture uh, organized uh, uh, in the Jazeera, so-called Jazeera scheme. The agricultural potential of Sudan is often talked about as a potential breadbasket for Africa and the Arab world, with a, a, 
you know, a promise of uh, developing into an agro-industrial powerhouse, an entry pole, and hub for uh, interstate transportation for the four landlocked countries around Sudan. This optimism, this optimism uh, for the country's future was captured more than 70 years ago uh, in the February 23rd, 1953 issue of Newsweek, which featured Sudan on the cover as, quote, a bright spot in a dark continent, unquote. This quote has not aged well for a multitude of reasons. But the prediction of this bright future was predicated on some data, some of which I already mentioned in a, uh, in a few minutes ago. Furthermore, the colonial administration, the British colonial administration bequeathed the country one of the best public institutions in Africa, including a distinguished educational system a decent infrastructure for agricultural research and extension, independent judiciary and civil service characterized by professionalism and high efficiency, as well as effective service institutions such as ports, railways, and postal service, services. The country, therefore, was seen as a rising African star that had a good prospect for building a stable democracy and robust modern economy. However, the reality is that despite the human and institutional capabilities that were available to Sudan at the dawn of independence more than 65 years ago, it has come to be defined by conflicts, political instability, and development failures. It's a highly socially polarized country without a unifying national identity and a politicized military. Sudan has so far experienced three long reigning dysfunctional autocratic military regimes interrupted by three popular uprisings in 1964, 1986, and more recently in 2018. The first two popular uprising led to short-lived democracies, while as before, the demise of the last autocratic regime led to the formation of the last transitional government in 2019, entrusted with the task of preparing the country for a democratic election in 2023. However, the latter transition proved to be even more precarious, and the transitional government was toppled by a military coup on December 25th, 2021, well before the much anticipated election in 2023. This peculiar political history came to be characterized in the popular Sudanese literature as the Sudanese syndrome. The glorious, or what we call in Arabic, Sawrat December al-Majida, in English, the glorious, the glorious December revolution in 2018, was a massive, peaceful, youthful, popular uprising that managed to topple one of the most brutal, long-reigning, kleptocratic regimes in Africa and the Arab world. Thus capturing the imagination of progressive democratic forces in and outside the region. It was a movement that thrilled, exhilarated, and inspired not only Sudanese, but everyone and every population that ever wanted to live freely, peacefully, and with dignity. Women, a group that was particularly targeted by the former regime, were at the forefront, 
The ideals of the movement are succinctly summarized by their iconic slogan, freedom, peace, and justice. By any standard, this uprising was unique, even for a country which has had two previous uprisings. The use that were, if you will, raised by the regime are essential because they represent over 65% of Sudan's 45 million people. The movement they created envisioned an inclusive and democratic national identity separate from a sectarian or regional tribal one. These useful uh, protesters chanted the name of ancient kings and queens of Nubia, thereby framing what it means to be Sudanese beyond their dominant or the dominant Afro, uh, dominant Arab and Islamic identity. The high point of the December revolution, the high point of the December revolution was the sit-in in front of the army high command in Khartoum. Translated from, it is Arabic text, a leading Sudanese poet and writer, Mr. Alim Abbas Muhammad Noor, described it as an epic act of genius, and it is, quote, cohesion, expression, diversity, coexistence, convergence, slogans, and everything that reflects the image of Sudan and its creative diversity, multiple cultures, beliefs, and languages in an epic visual acoustic painting and noble human solidarity in terms of values, morals, and principles, and sympathy, synergy, and altruism. I had the privilege of serving in the Sudan Transitional Government. It goes by the acronym SST, SSTG, Sudan, uh, Sudan Transitional Government, whose very existence come to be because of the energy, innovation, and belief of these young Sudanese who have sacrificed much, including their lives. One of my most memorable events during my visit to Washington, D.C., while attending the annual meetings of the World Bank and the IMF, shortly after the new government was sworn in, in September 2019, was a working lunch with a bipartisan group of young congressional staffers. At the time, I was pleasantly surprised by their knowledge, outpouring of support and enthusiasm for Sudan and its prospects as a role model for an emerging democratic, prosperous Africa. As it turns out, that was not to be. At the time, the SDG had to address a set of challenges, challenging political, security, and economic issues, including lifting the country from the US designated state sponsors of terrorism under the former regime. Undertaking sweeping economic reforms, improving economic welfare and livelihood, as well as rehabilitating Sudan as a member of good standing in the international development community, achieving peace with the armed movements, undertaking security reforms, eradicating the crony selective empowerment of members of the previous regime in state institutions and the private sector and prosecuting inherited corruption. Undertaking vast legislative reforms, revisiting the federal system, and last but not least, preparing for election and democratic transition. 
Perhaps the most notable success of the STG was removing the country from the SST list and the rehabilitation of the country as a member of good standing in the international development community. In large measure, these commendable achievements were facilitated by the outpouring of international support for Sudanese revolution, for the Sudanese revolution and the youth of Sudan. Also, the, SST, the STG economic reforms and renewal agenda was met with considerable appreciation by major bilateral donors, most notably the US, the UK, members, countries of the European Union, in addition to the African and Arab partners of Sudan. Sudan, as I used to say, Sudan, as I used to say, was on course to extricate itself from a hole that was $64 billion deep through the Paris Club process that was expected to lead to some $50 billion of debt forgiveness under the highly indebted poor country initiative, the so-called HIPIC initiative. The HIPIC initiative was created in 1996 to assist countries coming out of conflict or poor, highly indebted, non-conflict countries. This 50 billion associated with Sudan debt forgiveness would have accounted, would have accounted for more than a third of all the resources deployed for the HIPIC initiative since its inception. So it, 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 it would have been an extremely big deal. Importantly, as the, minister, as the Minister of Finance, as the Minister of Finance, I signed the initial framework agreement with the uh, IMF uh, related to the debt relief and other economic reform as contingent on liquidation of economic activities by the military and transferal of ownership of economic interest of the military to the civilian government. And it seems like this is one of the major motivation for the setback that we experienced by the leadership of the military. Despite the major challenges faced by the transitional government and the limited progress in other areas, Sudan was on course to score fundamental economic milestones. The economic reform and renewal program had the potential of promoting progress in other key areas, such as financing security reforms and peace building, as well as creating jobs for the large pool of unemployed Sudanese youth. Perhaps I will have a chance to provide more details on the process of economic reforms in the Q&A session. Unfortunately, the October 2021 coup derailed the much anticipated march towards democratic transition in the aftermath of a truly glorious revolution and thereby closed the pathway to economic reforms and national renewal that I had the honor to orchestrate as the lead cabinet member responsible for the economy, with, of course, the involvement of the entire cabinet under the leadership of the prime minister. The country has relived the melancholy Sudanese syndrome that afflicted its nation building and renewal since its independence. However, the coup was a desperate gamble that failed to tame the popular protest or to win international support. Therefore, the two leaders of Sudan Armed Forces, SAF, and Rapid Support Force, which goes by the acronym RSF, were forced to negotiate a return to the constitutional process with civilian leadership. 
April 2023 was supposed to mark the signing of a framework agreement endorsed by the regional and international community to transition Sudan to a full civilian government. However, the process broke down on the final agenda items associated with security reforms and restructuring of the armed forces, specifically over the key issues such as the timeline for integration of the rapid support force into the Sudanese armed forces, purging of what we call uh, in Sudan the Islamist cell. And the, way, and the term Islamist here has a deep meaning. It refers to uh, the entity in Sudan that called itself Islamic Front or Islamic Movement. But in fact, it was using this divine religion uh, in order to advance narrow-minded uh, sectarian or, fa or factional uh, end games. So the word Islamoist designed to uh, separate this, uh, uh, this, this political discourse uh, from the great religion of Islam. So these cells, in addition uh, to other uh, political affiliation should be uh, should be removed or uh, the army should be cleansed uh, from this. Uh, and so this, uh, this together simultaneously, the, 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 um, the merging of the armed forces should, co should be come hand in hand with purging of these Islamist cells. Uh, other differences, grave differences between the two leaders, uh, who would be the leader of the armed forces? So these agreements escalated to outbreak of armed hostilities in April 15. But I, uh, as I will show later, or at least claim later, there was a third party that actually ignited this uh, conflict. Uh, and this is an important fact that needs to figure uh, into the ultimate uh, resolution of this crisis. At this juncture, uh, we might ask, what went so horribly wrong with the Sudanese nation building, including these recent tra uh, tragic events? And what lesson can we draw for the current transition and events? How might Sudan break free from the vicious cycle that plagued its post-independence history into a stable, prosperous, and peaceful democratic country that was originally thought to be its destiny. As a fairest approximation, it could be argued that the country's tragic nation building experience might be attributed to the elite's failure to manage social fractionalization and achieve sustainable, equitable economic development. However, there are many counterexamples of successful experiences of societies with similar structural features. Moreover, such theory cannot address a key question as to why there are no learning by, there was no learning by the Sudanese elites despite repeated failures. And instead, I would argue, the state building model uh, of Asimoglu and Robinson, of course, notwithstanding the embarrassment that uh, I might cause for our good friend here. Uh, but my take is that actually, and I wrote a paper uh, that, that addressed this issue using the Robinson and Asimoglu's model, but some other approaches as well. I think I will show it is very relevant uh, to explaining the Sudanese syndrome, uh, or at least contributing to better understanding of the Sudanese syndrome. I think I'm speaking in a, uh, uh, in a school, of course, that I'm assuming is very familiar with uh, Professor Robinson's uh, research. So I think I don't need to explain. It's an Euclidean uh, uh, space with horizontal and vertical axes. Obviously, the model itself is a very complex game theoretic model, but uh, this suffices to explain the basic idea. 
that horizontal reflect the power of society and the vertical, the power of the elites that control the state. And so you can cite example of uh, when the elites dominate the society, such as the case of the Chinese or China under the Chinese Communist Party, uh, even though it's up there as a, as, a, as a powerful authoritarian developmental state. But then you could also have a situation of our former regime in Sudan, which was a, a dysfunctional, uh, you know, uh, brutal yet uh, incompetent uh, authoritarian state, which will be at the lower end of the, of, uh, of, the, of the vertical axis. On the other hand, on the horizontal axis, you would find in the other extreme societies that are, are strong and by design did not allow the state to, to, to gain its strength, but the society itself uh, is, 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 uh, is disarticulated uh, along, uh, you know, social allegiances, sect, uh, you know, sectarian, uh, tribal, whatever. So the best option really is for societies to build, uh, you know, mutual strengths in a context between state and society. And so the state building proceed along, the, uh, along this corridor, which can be quite narrow as in the case of Sudan. So when a revolution happened, it actually uh, at least uh, partially align the strengths of society with the strengths of the, uh, of the, of the authoritarian uh, military elites and their supporters, uh, and then enter the corridor. Uh, rather than moving upward in a positive sum game where the strengths of society and the strengths of the state actually mutually uh, reinforce each other uh, moving forward uh, towards um, a mature democracy. Uh, actually, for the case of Sudan, the syndrome is essentially about a revolution or an uprising that gets aligned the, the relative strengths between the elites and the society and gets uh, the Sudanese society into the, uh, into the corridor uh, but then the staying power of the forces that actually combined to create that alignment fade over time, over a very short time actually in the case of Sudan. And so that's the reason why we have this short-lived dysfunctional democracies. So the Sudan gets out of the corridor and uh, until another uprising come. And especially this uh, has been uh, the case in Sudan due to three factors that might actually bring back the theory about uh, the uh, polarization. That you continue to have this polarization uh, while in the corridor. Uh, in, the, in our case, it was huge political polarization. Uh, differences, stark differences about how to manage the economy uh, and the politics and so on. And then also lack of uh, credible institutions for resolving conflicts that could act as arbiters you know, arbiter for uh, mediating the conflicts. And then major economic and political crisis. And this is usually the case after uh, a long reigning dysfunctional regime as in the case of Sudan. So while entering the corridor seems to be, in our case, uh, a charter territory, done it three times for the Sudanese society, broadening this corridor and staying in it is uh, the daunting challenge that has so far evaded the people of Sudan. So I see this model as not necessarily providing the ultimate answer, but at least focusing at attention on what needs to be done in terms of the design of the social contract for uh, entering and staying in the corridor. Sudan now finds itself outside of the corridor, and instead of transitioning to civilian rule, followed by democracy, the country is being systematically destroyed by high intensity violence in the capital and other major cities between two armies, each with massive destructive power. The literature suggests that even in the case of low intensity civil wars, it could destroy more than 20% of GDP in just one year. This 
factional military warfare is likely to have already destroyed that much or more since it started a month ago. In view, it is intensity and concentration in a capital that accounted by more than a third of the national GDP. This conflict already caused massive deaths and human suffering, including forcing more than a million Sudanese to leave their homes as internationally displaced or refugees, or refugees. Even worse, if allowed to continue, this war could spiral into a full-fledged, long-duration ethnic civil war. This puts a huge premium on the American-Saudi process, the so-called Jeddah peace talks. This is a coastal city in the Red Sea uh, uh, of Jeddah of Saudi Arabia. For arranging an immediate ceasefire to allow humanitarian assistance and hopefully eventually lead to a return to civilian rule and democratic transition. The people of Sudan are now pinning their hopes on the Jeddah peace process. The current situation, though terrifying and horrific for the civilian population, could provide an opportunity for the sponsors of the Jeddah talks with the support of the African Union, the Arab League, and the UN system to put credible pressures on the two warring sides to accept a ceasefire and eventually return to the process of security sector reform and civilian democratic transition. The Sudanese civilian democratic forces also, very importantly, need to do their part and agree on a collective platform to mobilize the Sudanese people behind it, to express their popular support for peace and rejection of war. The restructuring of the security sector must be based on purging staff of supporters of the former regime and depoliticization of the army as a whole in parallel with integration of the RSF and other armed groups into a unified professional army according to international, internationally accepted standards of security, uh, security reforms. Moreover, because this conflict is widely believed to be ignited by a third party, I think at the political level, a central question the people of Sudan are entitled to know is how this tragic violence started. As such, I think it is incumbent upon us to call for a thorough, open, and credible, but also timely investigation of this vital question by the AU, the Arab League, and the UN system. This investigation should be an integral component of the peace building and political settlement process and, uh, and whoever proven to be responsible for this heinous crime should be held accountable legally and politically. In view of the consequences of this destructive conflict, some of the earlier items stipulated in the framework agreement between the Civilian Democratic Coalition and both of SAF and, and RSF leadership must be revised. The armed forces cannot be left, firstly, the armed forces cannot be left to retain control over its affairs as an independent sovereign institution during the two critical years of the transitional period before a popular national election could be held. The transitional civilian authority must exercise full supervision over the armed forces and other regular forces. Secondly, a national peace conference should be convened and involve all stakeholders from conflict affected regions instead of the usual piecemeal uh, uh, agreements that favor armed or military groups. Thirdly, formation of a transitional authority of national and professional competencies by all stakeholders, except for the parties associated with the former regime involved in igniting sedition, which should be held 
accountable under Sudanese and international law if proven to have ignited this sedition. This process may be, must be granted by the international community to allow for genuine security reforms leading to a, an apolitical, unified, professional army under civilian authority. The people of Sudan need to address three fundamental questions as to how might the country re-enter into this uh, AR corridor, how to broaden this corridor, stay in it long enough for the nascent democracy to mature, and how to engineer such a hefty national project. Sudanese society must develop an open marketplace of ideas to nurture a meaningful and transparent societal dialogue leading to a viable social contract to underpin the national project. An important instrument for promoting the social contract is a compelling, unifying, culturally specific, and credible national narrative. The social contract must account for both economic and political agenda, for promoting political settlements and national renewal, that is, electoral political legitimacy is not enough. The survival of democracy requires commitment by democratic elites to economic development. Finally, successful execution of the social contract must be a living process of social learning and interactive cross-fertilizing engagement among the key actors, the society, the political elite, as well as the economic elite. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was going to ask a question, but we're, we're short of time, so perhaps it would be good if people I let someone from the floor ask a question. Would that be appropriate? We have mics, so just yes. raise your hand and we'll get to you. No? Everyone's shy? Too shy? You, you mentioned polarization, and then you mentioned that it was actually possibly a third party that provoked the civil war. So uh, who, what are the poles and uh, what uh, might lead them to find some common political order, whatever that might be? And what uh, then was the motivation of this third party? And, and, and who is the third party? Shall I answer? OK, um, how do we, yeah, you could, yeah. OK, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, that's, that's a, an, an important question. Uh, you know, uh, the former regime, uh, even by the standard of the Sudanese autocratic history, uh, and even, I would say, uh, the African and, and Arab world history, it was uh, a very egregious regime in terms of uh, the brutality and the callous disregard of the uh, national treasures and assets, institutional and people of the country. Uh, and it was driven by a devious religious ideology and was able actually to rule the country with an iron fist for 30 years and uh, illegally accorded um, uh, preferential treatment to the followers of the so-called uh, Islamic uh, Front or Islamic Movement. They basically privatized the state and therefore creating uh, a power base of fanatics and opportunists who, despite the glorious revolution in which the Sudanese youth and the inter-Sudanese population expressed their will 
and resoundly rejected that regime. Uh, they remain, uh, they, they kind of uh, laid uh, low, waiting for the, the, the revolution to subside and for the, uh, for the, for the people of Sudan to start, uh, you know, uh, engulfed into differences and so on, uh, before they mounted a, a comeback. And this comeback became very clear during the holy months of Ramadan, uh, the last 10 days. They were holding uh, uh, meetings around the breaking of the fast and threatening that they will not allow the, uh, the political process to proceed, that they will disrupt and they will open, uh, openly challenging uh, this. And they were saying that we do have brigades and these brigades actually tried to violently disband the sit-in uh, in front of the high command, but some elements of the armed forces, especially young officers, they challenged them and, and, and actually, uh, you know, engaged them in a fight and chased them away. But since then, they continue to be uh, a subversive, divisive force, despite the fact that they were given an opportunity by the transitional government to basically uh, accept that there is a, a regime change revolutionary regime change by the people of Sudan and to prepare themselves to reinvent themselves as uh, you know a democratic uh, uh, you know uh, force or party within the Sudan they never accepted that and so they were actually fanning the flame uh, of this conflict and there are actually some evidence that needs to be proven and, and, and investigated that actually the fairest attack, on the rapid support, support force was not done by the army. It was done by these cells uh, in the army, these factional cells, as well as their, uh, you know, their armed delegates. Uh, and so that's the, the third party. I didn't want to uh, mention it explicitly, but the Sudanese media, uh, social media is rife with, uh, with all this evidence about them fanning the flames and spoiling for a fight. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your work and for your optimism and, and everything. Uh, also, uh, the first academic paper I ever presented was at ERF uh, in my younger days. Uh, so thank you for that too. Um, so the questions about, because you've looked at economics and finance, typically like at least in American policy, we think of like post-conflict and then, you know, there's like wartime or a conflict time. In terms of econ economic development, do you think there's, there's economic uh, activities that can support the Sudanese economy even during conflict or you know before before like a peace deal is met to kind of mitigate some of the harm that conflict has especially given some new trends in like remote work and accessing the diaspora and these sort of things uh, thank you this question is interesting or me you yes <laughs> no yeah So the question is about the economy. Uh, did yeah. Get it? Huh? I didn't get it right. So what he was he asking the question? Yeah, he's well. You want to try again? <laughs> Can you speak up a little bit? I, yeah. I wasn't yeah. really. Oh, I'm sorry. I also uh, have a cold. Um, it's basically. Um, do you think uh, there's there's strategies for Sudan to either mitigate economic atrophy during conflict or to even boost some sectors of economic development during conflict? Kind of against the paradigm that economic development is typically post-conflict. Yeah. Okay, I didn't get it right, but anyway, I think he was talking about the economy. Yeah, what's the prospects for, for, for kind of economic development during the conflict? Is there any hope for economic development during the conflict? Or? Well, actually, uh, during this conflict or historically? Yeah. Uh, either one. Yeah, or, yeah I think there is, there is, a, there is a, a body of literature uh, that looked a long time ago that looked at the, the in-conflict growth in low-intensity violence setting. And, uh, you know, the, the argument is that actually the initial phases uh, of the conflict tend to destroy physical capital and uh, uh, in, in institutions and, and also the, transactive, the transaction-intensive activities 
uh, like manufacturing and, 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 and banking and transport and so on. But because the conflict tends to be low intensity, like in most sub-Saharan Africa, as opposed to the high intensity violence in East Europe that, that tends to be highly intense, uh, that happened after the break, uh, uh, the breakup of the Soviet, former Soviet Union, but it was also short-lived. Uh, in the case of Africa, uh, conflicts tend, like in Sudan, it took two phases, one 18 years and another one 20 years or so. So it tends to be long, but it is low intensity violence. So, uh, and also it tends to be in, in the rural areas and remote areas and so on. So you could have in conflict growth, but it's still, uh, you know, it, 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 it won't be the kind of growth that will make transformation, economic transformation. Uh, you know, uh, and the case of Sudan, especially this last phase, uh, there is no way that you could expect Sudan to grow uh, in, in a context of this violence, which even if, uh, you know, even, uh, even if it subsided, it is likely to create, uh, you, know, you know, regional zones of authority for, for the two warring uh, armies. So you will have a situation, might be, uh, God forbid, similar to the situation in Libya, uh, which obviously uh, is unable to, to recover. So I would say that in conflict growth uh, might happen, but it, it requires some conditions, such as low intensity violence in remote areas, and so on and so forth. I think we only have time for one more question. Amy Chua of Tiger Mom fame, you may know her, put forward a theory about most of these conflicts are driven by a market dominant minority being resented by the majority of the population. Can you address any, any component of that in the current um, conflict in Sudan? Yes, I think... Um if, if you think of conflict as a continuum, uh, you know, it could be like violent protests, uh, non-peaceful protests, riots, and then uh, violent coups, and all the way to a large scale civil war violence. The history of Sudan, and I think also the history of Africa, usually violent conflicts in the form of uh, coups are, are perpetrated by the majority because they tend to be the one that control the army and the, and the sovereign assets of the society. Uh, but civil wars have always been, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, has been uh, perpetrated by minority groups who feel marginalized, culturally, economically, uh, and politically. And that has been the case of Sudan, that's why uh, the long history of civil wars in Sudan did not happen in the, in the Nile Riverain region, the, the main stay of the, of the Sudanese state, because these are the elites who control the state historically. But um, the power grab is usually happens in terms of coups. But uh, in Darfur, which is uh, historically been a marginal, uh, even though it's a big state with large population, uh, but, um, uh, you know, some communities in Darfur took arms uh, because of the marginalization. Of course, before that, the Southern Sudanese, uh, who actually started the civil war even before the country got its independence uh, back in, uh, nine, uh, you know, the first uh, civil war started in 1953 uh, or 54, before the country got its independence in 19. Uh, in 1956. Hmm. Okay, I think I think we have to we have to stop. Okay. So so thank you very much. I'd just like to end by thanking everybody for coming. Uh, thank you for taking part in our events, and I'd really like to thank the whole Pearson uh, team: uh, Sheila Kohantiv, Anna Mediaris, who's somewhere.
uh, Molly O'Donnell and Emily McGill. We have a fantastic team that makes all of this happen. Uh, you thought I was the person who made it all happen, uh, but, but no, no. Uh, they make it happen, and they make it happen seamlessly and fabulously, so I'd like to thank them very much for all their support.